uh, we continue on on the um, Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. That's what we're dealing with. And uh, not last week, but the week before, we had Pastor Pete uh, here. Uh, and he kind of let it off for us. And I, I, I just want to say that uh, the, the stuff that we talked about um, um, the, uh, two weeks ago, basically, um, Pastor Pete has done um, kind of a series on. So a lot of the information that we have that we're going to be imparting to you comes from him. So I just want to acknowledge that up front. Uh, it's not necessarily, some of it um, comes, uh, will, will come from just our studies, but also s some of it comes from him. So I just want to acknowledge that, that sort of thing and to start off and, and say that. Okay, so uh, we talked about the pre-reformers, uh, Jan Hus, uh, he mentioned and talked about, and John Wycliffe, those were pre-reformers. And it's important because of the context. So today, we're going to lay a little bit more foundation work. And we're going to talk about the stranglehold that the, the Roman Catholic Church has had on that period. And, but it's just a snapshot. We, you could talk weeks about it, but we're just going to only talk about it today, uh, about the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And um, it, it's also, I want to keep in mind that... Um, their stranglehold that they had wasn't just for a few years. It was century after century, many centuries, okay? So just keep that context in mind. And they greatly uh, influenced, uh, I'm going to mention the Eastern Orthodox Church. I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. They influenced that. They certainly had influence on the Protestant Reformation. So. All of that didn't take place in a vacuum. It didn't take place in a few years. It took place over years and centuries, really, that sort of thing. So um, many of you know uh, that I grew up in a Catholic home, so a large Catholic family. Uh, we went to Catholic church. I went to uh, catechism and uh, that sort of thing. And I would have to say uh, and I probably would have other Catholics would agree with me that the Catholic Church has been very good to people, okay? And so that's how my view was. The Catholic Church was very good. And, uh, you know, you learn things and you try to do your best. It's, uh, and so this idea of doing your good works. And there's a foundation or reason for that that I'm going to be talking about. But I would tell you, growing up as a Catholic, I wanted to do... Uh, the right thing. I wanted to be good and I tried to be good and sometimes I wasn't successful and I fell and I failed and I knew it. Uh, you'd blow it. So, but I do remember that and I do, um, I, I would tell you that talking to another Catholic, uh, they would probably agree, yeah, the Catholic Church is very good to them. And as a result, it, it is so difficult to get people to see the depravity of their sin and where they stand and that they need re truly need a savior and not a church okay and it's very very difficult i remember uh in my early 20s a matter of fact i was probably 20 when uh i the gospel was being presented to me i heard and knew about the gospel knew about jesus christ but it was being presented to me in a different way and I was being attracted to that. And that was God was pulling me along to save me during this time period. It didn't happen in a day or week. It wasn't so there was conversations taking place, and this guy had said, "Why don't you come with me to to my church?" And his church was a Baptist church. Never been in any other church other than the Catholic Church. But I said yes because God was pulling me along. But I remember. I remember before I went through the church doors and I was thinking, man, should, should I be in here? This, uh, something's not quite right. I don't know if I'm allowed to go in and do this. And that was my Catholic upbringing, telling me, I don't know. So then I went through the threshold, went through the door and into the auditorium and, oh, it was very different. V everything was very different. 
okay, for me. But God used that in a particular way in my life. Okay, so it, it's that it's that upbringing. I, I uh, a couple other stories I'm going to give you before we get into the materials. Um, when I was uh, this happened when I was very young, so I, d I didn't even know about it until later when my siblings told me about it. But one of my siblings, uh, this is the not the good side of the Catholic Church. This is the more the bad side. But one of the my siblings had come home and. Um, a neighbor had talked to them and so they came home and and told my mother and what the neighbor had said is well if you don't go to church you're gonna go to hell and so here's this little kid telling my mother this and my mother got upset she was Irish Catholic she was born in Boston and here her children her young children are saying this children didn't understand it uh, but she did and it kind of led to a series of us for her to, to not necessarily pull us out of the Catholic Church, but not require us to go. I, I still did catechism. I still did these things. I still was going. Up until about middle school, I went to Catholic Church. And then as I got into high school, I realized nobody else is going. I'm going to stop. Okay? Another sister told me this story, and I never knew this. Uh, she had talked with my grandmother. And uh, my grandmother had told her this, that uh, her mother, and her mother uh, came directly from Ireland, Irish Catholic, in the early 1900s, her mother told her that uh, she had um, three passes to heaven, three tickets to heaven that she had purchased from the Catholic priest. And the Catholic priest guaranteed heaven to her. That's called indulgences, just so you know. When you hear that indulgences, that's an example of indulgences. And so she, uh, my grandmother related that to my oldest sister. And I never even knew that, but she said, oh yeah, that sticks out in my mind big time, type of thing that, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff took place. Well, it took place back then. It's, it still takes place today, okay? And so I think it, it helps us, gives us context for this. Okay, so um, I want to start off with this. What does it matter and uh, the importance of the, uh, the Protestant Reformation? So, you know, why is this, this important? You know, what, what should I be learning about this? And I just don't want this to be just a history lesson. It is, but I also want to go a little bit further about these truths. I think that they're important to us. So I've kind of outlined some of these for you on your, on your materials there. And uh, the first one, the Bible is the only source of revealed truth. And 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, and 2 Peter 1, 20 uh, through 21 tells us that. And, and really, this is in contrast in terms of the Bible, the only source of real truth this is in contrast to what the Catholic Church teaches and believes so this is what the Catholic Church says that it's not just the Bible scripture but it's also the traditions and it's also the Pope and they all have equal weight equal footing equal authority so Protestants uh, believe no it's the Bible that's the, our, our sole and final authority. But the um, Catholic Church says, no, it's not just the Bible, it's also tradition, and it's also the Pope. Okay? The second point is we are justified by faith, and that's coming from uh, Romans 1.17. And, uh, you know, um, it's good works. The idea is good works does not save you. So Martin Luther came to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and realized, it's not the works that I'm doing. I'm not justified by any of those works. Okay? I'm just a, justified by, by God, by God alone. So the Catholic Church would teach, oh, good works saves you. Uh, so uh, no more sacrifice sacraments uh, or or doing good works uh, and pleasing God by gaining his favor. That doesn't work. It's justification by faith. And the third point is, you know, the priesthood consists of all true believers. And that's pointed out in 1 Peter 2, 
verse 5 and also uh, verse 9 and then Revelation 1 5 and 6 so uh, you don't need to be really um, a, a you don't really need to confess to a holy priest okay that was the that's the idea there um, it's not the priest who intercedes for us it's Christ we go to God and Christ intercedes on our our behalf but the Catholic Church teaches, oh, it's the, pr the priest who does that, does that kind of work. Uh, just another review here about the five solas. So two weeks ago, Pastor Pete talked about these five solas. Remember these? So, uh, you know, the great foundational uh, truths or rallying cries of the Protestant Church, reformers, basically, sola scriptura. Scripture alone, sola gratia, gratia, grace alone, sola fide, justification by faith alone, sola Christus, Christ alone, and soli dea gloria, to God alone be the glory. So all these five solas stand in contrast to um, what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, you see? And so um, the reformers, people like Martin Luther, for instance, uh, realize that well, we, there, we need to make a distinguishment here between what the Roman Catholic Church is saying and what we're saying. And so the reformers uh, be, by the way um, do you remember um, uh, maybe, maybe Pastor Pete didn't say this but uh, why we're called Protestants? Because it was a protest, right? And so it called Protestants. But that protest is in these five solas, okay? And it, it's a con, contra distinction between the Roman Catholic Church, okay? So that's uh, a, a, a basic review. Um, and also, well, this is why this stuff is pretty important. So let's talk about <clears throat> the history of Roman Catholicism. And so I've got a handout there for you. And I kind of want to go through that. If you want to take notes, great. If you don't, you don't have to, okay? However, so let's go through this. Let's talk about the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the handout says, as the 15th century died and 16th century was born, the old world seemed to die at the hands of the new one. The mighty Byzantine Empire, uh, they, they fall, by the way, and uh, uh, do you remember, does anybody know who the Byzantines fall to? First of all, the Byzantine uh, Empire was centered in um, Constantinople. And Constantinople today is Istanbul, Turkey. So that's where the center was. Just like the Roman Catholic Church, if I say, where is the Roman Catholic Church center? You would tell me? Vatican and Rome. Okay? Right. So, who did, who did the, uh, the Byzantine Empire fall to? It was the Turks. Who are the Turks? Muslims. That's, that's who we're talking about. So they fell to the Muslims, basically. The, it's the Ottoman Turks is what it is, the Muslims. And so Constantinople falls to the Turks. It was in 1453. And so we have the last remnant of Imperial Rome it had collapsed. Also during that time, Columbus discovers a new world in the Americas, 1492. And this guy, Corn uh, Copernicus, I think that's how you spell, uh, pronounce his name, Copernicus, he was, he was a uh, Polish scientist. He came from Poland area, and he was a scientist. And he, so he turns the universe on its head with this heliocentrism, and Helio's son, centrism central and his theory astronomical theory was that the earth revolved around the sun well, um, and the planets revolved around the sun um, and um, that was big because the catholic teaching at the time was the sun and planets revolved around the earth and so that kind of threw them on their head in terms of that teaching Okay, that's what's going on. Gutenberg, he invented the printing press, right? Okay, so, and obviously his pamphlets and the Bibles played a huge important role in uh, getting out the, the news. So all these events are happening in Europe, and it's great change and stability, as Pastor Pete mentioned. The Apostle Peter, uh, whom Jesus said, you are Peter, 
upon this rock, I will build my church, was thought to have been martyred and buried in Rome. Uh, I've been to Rome, uh, and in, in terms of martyred, this is uh, um, St. Peter's, the Basilica, right up there. Okay, And just behind me, you can see this little uh, obelisk. Okay, and that's where it's thought that he was martyred. Okay, there's a little plaque there that says that that's what they think. That's the spot where he was martyred. And then he was buried in the basilica up there, okay, underneath it somewhere. So literally, the Catholic Church is built on top of Peter. And they take this literally. In other words, this scripture, uh, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. This is how they view that. This is what they, they're saying. Yeah. That's where it comes into play. Okay? And so, um, okay, I, I, I don't agree with their interpretation, but that's what they're doing. Once the Roman, Roman Empire had looked to Rome um, as its mother, and that's a fill in uh, the Roman Empire looked to Rome as its mother, and Caesar as its father. Now, this is kind of important, uh, why I bring this in here, okay? That, that's how the people looked at the city of Rome. So, Rome was the mother, and Caesar was the father. Now, when the, the Christian church comes along, uh, they take on this concept and, and change it just a little bit. And they change it to, well, Rome is still the mother, okay? But now the hope the bishop of Rome becomes the father that's where that comes into play okay and so it was an easy transition for the people who were living in Rome to make that transition from Caesar to uh, the Pope okay so now the um, um, so that imagery basically helped the people okay all right, in the third and fourth centuries, uh, as the church expands, uh, five major cities become the major hubs of Christianity in the fourth century, okay? And so we have Rome, we have Constantinople, we have Antioch, we have Jerusalem, and Alexandria. Those are the five major cities. So Alexandria is in Egypt, it's down here. Of course, we have Jerusalem over here. We have Antioch right here. And uh, let's see, uh, right around here, that's Constantinople. And then we have Rome right over here, okay? So that, those are the major hubs, okay? Of, of Christianity and something interesting happens in the 300s that's the Roman Emperor Constantine he converts to Christianity and he forms this Edict of Mil Milan on 313 which legalized Christianity so he becomes a, a Christian imp Emperor and he legalizes Christianity in the Roman Empire now can you imagine the people uh, no more persecution, no more death, right? They had to be joyous about that. They had to be very happy. They're not going to be persecuted for their faith. But in the fourth uh, uh, century, that Con Constantine decides to move the capital of uh, Rome, okay? And he moves it over to a, a city called Con he forms called Constantinople. Mines and Tinium. It was already there, and he, he says this is going to be the new capital for the Roman Empire. Now, he didn't, uh, what, he re what really happened is he just bifurcated or split. So we still had uh, uh, Rome as a capital, and now we have Constantinople as a capital. And he establishes thrones on both, because he's the empire. I mean, he's, he's the Roman empire, Emperor of the whole Roman Empire. And that's what he does. And so there's competing, there's a, a papal uh, uh, in Rome, uh, the, the bishop, the, the pope in Rome, and then there is the uh, emperor, 
is in Constantinople. So that's what's, that's what's happening. They, and he establishes the East, Eastern, what we call now today, the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's where it got its beginnings, its, its establishment, okay? So Constantinople becomes the Eastern capital of the Roman Empire in 330, and later the Hagia Sophia becomes their nation, national church, and the Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom, so that's the Hagia Sophia right there behind me. That's in Istanbul today. That church is still there. Uh, it's been built in several different ways. As a matter of fact, do you see uh, these towers, these rocket ships? You know what that reminds you of? The minarets of the Muslims. And so what happened is, is that this was first the Eastern Orthodox Church for a long, long time, and then the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, invaded and took over and established Muslim. And so uh, that went up till about the, the 1900s. I don't know exactly when there, a transition took place in Istanbul regarding this, and uh, they get, they didn't quite give it back to the Eastern Orthodox Church. What they said is, okay, you can, you can use it. We're not going to use it as, uh, as um, for Muslim, We're, uh, but we don't want you to use it as a church. So guess what? They made it out. I mean, museum. They made it a museum, okay? So today it's a museum, but back then uh, um, it was the beginning of the Eastern Orthodox Church, okay? And uh, as far as Constant, uh, Constantine, the emperor, uh, this is his rule, okay? And it's pretty substantial. We've got Africa, we've got Spain, uh, France, England, Germany, that sort of thing. So he kind of ruled quite a bit. As a matter of fact, he, people would say he was truly emperor of the wor then world at that time, okay? And that's how they kind of viewed him. Um, this Byzantine Empire in Constantinople, um, I say here, Byzantine Empire, which is the center of the or Orthodox faith, and by the way, when I, you read Eastern Orthodox, both Greek and even Russian today, okay, that's what that is, uh, that lasts from about 330, is when he, they established it, all the way up to 1453. Now that's a long time. That's a really, really long time, over a thousand years, but yet uh, not much is mentioned in the history books regarding it, okay? And it's because uh, they ultimately lost their wars, their battles, okay? And so usually when the losers lose, uh, they don't get the write-ups, so to speak, in terms of history. And, and that's exactly what has taken place. So back to our outline. So in
That's the mindset of the Catholic Church. Guess what? It's the same mindset today. You do these sacraments, you will be saved. Okay? And so people became members of the Roman Catholic Church through participating in the sacraments. That's how they did this. The, these are still dispensed. I already mentioned my great-grandmother getting tickets to heaven. You know, the, these are still going on. Okay? And I was taught uh, that, uh, you know, that if you were baptized as an infant, that you, you would be saved. See, these are part of those. So there's seven different uh, sacraments, and they're critically important. So what are they? I've got a listing of here for them. Baptism. And by the way, that's infant baptism, what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Okay? So baptism. Confirmation. Okay? The third one, Mass. That's critically important. I put in parentheses the Eucharist. Okay? And uh, the bread and wine. Okay, the communion is what we call that. But that's probably the most important one because that's where the Eucharist happens. Penance, uh, marriage, ordination, and the last one's last rites. Okay, in other words, anointing those who are sick and the ones who are about to die. So those are the seven sacraments. And basically, the church is, uh, I have down here, basically the church would dispense grace to its members through the sacraments. Um, most people, that is just the, the average person back then, okay, not today, but back then, uh, were uneducated and illiterate. In other words, uh, they couldn't read. They couldn't write. So did you have to participate in each of those seven sacraments? Yes. Okay, so the obvious question, marriage. What about priests in marriage? They didn't get the pre, you know, well, did, did priests get married? And so the Catholic Church said, uh, again, over time, they developed the teaching or the theology that, no, you shouldn't get married. And part of that is coming from the Apostle, Apostle Paul talking about, uh, in, uh, about marriage, you know, whether it's good or not. And he gives us some amount of instruction for people on that. And he says it's better not to. And so the Catholic Church, pardon me? If it's going to cause you to sin, if it, if it's, gonna cause you to sin it's, a, it's a problem. And so they developed their theology that the, the priest should be celibate. That's what you're referring to right there. Okay? So we have these, um, but here the, the important point is, is that the people back then, they just didn't have the education like we have today. They couldn't read. Okay? Um, and uh, they couldn't write. They didn't have the same kind of background understanding. Back then, there was no Bible for them like we have today. And on top of that, when the Mass was taking place, the priest would say it in Latin, whether the priest knew Latin or not. And some of them didn't. Yeah. And so the people couldn't understand anyway. And it wasn't a regular normal language for them. So it was very difficult for them to understand. So that's what was, that was, that, that's really what's, what's happening. Um, let's see, back to our, our, our outline here. So, um, the, the, so the people could easily relate to the mechanical process of grace being provided through the sacraments, you see. And thus their faith became implicit um, as opposed to explicit. So today, uh, we want to go and worship uh, God, and um, we want to go and read our Bible, we want to hear God's Word being proclaimed, we want to study it, we want to do, we want to pray, we want to fellowship together. Back then, it was, no, you follow these sacraments, and you're, you're good, you're okay. And so it was implicitly understood that you would be saved by that. Um, the Mass. The Mass was central to the whole system. Okay? And that's yet fill in the Mass. As Christ's body would be sacrificed afresh to God upon the altar each day. Say that again. 
Christ's body being sacrificed upon the altar each day. In other words, there was an altar in every Catholic church. As far as I know, the ones I've been in, there's always been altars. Today. But back then, there was an altar. And so that's the idea of, the, of, of his body being sacrificed afresh to God each and every day as an atoning sacrifice so that, so that God's anger towards sin would be appeased. That was the thinking. So the people would normally get to eat bread once a year, okay, just once a year, and would never get to drink from the chalice. In other words, uh, drink the wine. Okay, so, um, you know, the reason for this uh, practice was because the clergy was afraid that the people would mishandle the bread and the wine. In other words, they'd spill it all over. So you think, well, what's the big, okay, so you spill something on the, on the floor, you clean it up, right? <laughs> but uh, not so with the Catholics, it was a big deal because the Catholics taught that the bread was the actual body of Christ, was literally the body of Christ. The wine was literally the blood of Christ. And it's what is called in Catholic doctrine transubstantiation. You might have heard of that. And so the bread is turned into the actual, the literal body of Christ. The, the wine is turned into his blood. Transubstantiation. That's, that was the idea. Okay, that was... And so uh, if that's the case, um, they were prohibited, prohibited from taking the wine and only once a year could do the bread, okay? Now, remember, the people couldn't read, they couldn't understand much, they didn't understand the full significance of this sacrament as far as what we call today communion. Um, and, and obviously those priests are giving it in Latin, so it's hard. So simply looking upon the elements was enough to provide great, the grace of God to the audience. So in other words, to the members who are participating in these sacraments. Continuing on in our outline here, in 1215, the Lateran Council. Uh, Lateran is a place in, uh, it's a Lateran pla palace in Rome, okay? Um, and it's, it was a gathering of the Pope and, and they did a council. That's how they did things back then. They met together. They came up with what it hoped would be a useful aid for those seeking to be Justified. Oh, well, let me say that again. They came up with a useful aid for those seeking to be justified. Do you seek to be justified? No! Oh. I meant I sought to be justified by Christ alone. Right. I did seek it. And so who does the justification? Christ alone. Right. Where they're thinking, no, they are, seek to be justified. Do you see the difference here? They're seeking to, to try to be justified in front of God, and it doesn't work, because only God's the one who justifies. And so here they say, okay, how can we, be just, uh, how can we seek to be justified? And they came up with what it hoped to be a useful aid for those seeking to be justified. Um, it required all Christians on pain of eternal damnation to confess their sins regularly to a priest. That's how they did it. That's where that confession comes in to play. It came into play in 1215. Confess your sins to the priest and you will, you're seeking to be justified, you will be justified. Uh-oh. So we got a problem because the reformers looked at that and said, justification by faith in Christ, not by these actions and good works that you're doing, supposedly. Okay? So this is when the Catholics started confessing to a priest. The church's official teaching was quite clear that nobody would die righteous enough to have merited salvation fully. So not only did they say, confess your sins, but they also, during this Lateran Council, say, well, nobody can be 
fully righteous, okay, type of thing. Unless Christians died unrepentant of mortal sin, such as murder, and so that they, my point is in which they would go to hell, they would have the chance after death to have all their sins purged from them in purgatory before entering heaven fully cleansed. This is where that idea of purgatory came into play in, in 1215. That's where we get this idea of purgatory in terms of purging their sins. And uh, it, it, I say we created an entire purgatory industry and as what we call now today and, and they called back then indulgences came into play about that. And uh, you know, and, and th this is what Martin Luther objected to. You know, he objected to this indulgences, having sins purged. Uh, but can you see people who are uneducated and, and illiterate? They would accept this. They would go right along with it and say, of course, okay, this is how, how it's done. And I mean, I'm thinking, how else would they know? Continuing on, at the same time, the cult of saint worship had become popular. Okay, the worship of saints. People in the Middle Ages became more and more frightened of Jesus. Viewing him as a doomsday judge. They viewed Jesus as one coming on a white horse to judge them uh, and, and vanquishing his foes and sending them off into hell. That's how they, they viewed that. And, and the people were frightened about this. I have to say, today, uh, people are not as frightened about hell as they were back then. Okay? Today, there's quite a bit more casual attitude towards that. And it's, that's sad. Uh, but the people back then, they were frightened about that. And so, uh, as a result, thus they sought his mother to intercede on their behalf. Okay, so who wouldn't listen to their mother, right? And so, the seeking of Mary becomes a regular practice among the people uh, for Mary to go before them to plead their case uh, to Jesus, her son. That was the idea. And it's not just Mary, by the way, uh, who intercede. See, there's lots of saints, but Mary's mother, through other documents that we have, her name was Anne. And Anne's a big name in the Catholic Church. St. Anne. It's just all over the place. And that's Mary's mother. So they go to St. Anne to plead uh, to an angry God, okay, and to plead their case. And so this was the beginning of, of Mariology and all the other saints that we have. Getting back to um, uh, our outline here, something else happened, something kind of a little bit different. Uh, in 1305, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, that's in France, Bordeaux, France, becomes Pope and moves the papal capital from Rome to France. So here we have, in Rome, we had the papal, where, where the Pope was, Constantinople uh, was still existing, and that's where emperors were and now uh, we have a change take place and the reason why is you had uh, Italian bishops and you had French bis bishops and when the French exceeded in terms of the number of bishops than Italians then guess who they're going to vote for Pope? A French Pope. And so a French Pope is, uh, is elected Pope and so that French Pope moves the capital to Bordeaux, France. And from 1305 to 1378. And in 1378, the Italians grow tired of no pope in Rome, and they choose an Italian pope to replace the French, French, French pope, okay? Because there's no pope in Rome, the city becomes ruined uh, because of the loss of revenue. Now, when you don't have a pope, uh, then the indulgences and money going, not going there. It goes to where the pope it resides, and so, Rome kind of fell down a little bit. But here's, here's why, here's the surprising thing, is throughout this time period, uh, I mean, the Roman Catholic Church is experiencing corruption. It's, uh, uh, many of the popes, uh, well, some of the popes are not even priests, okay? Some of the, during this time, they're not even priests. They have mistresses, they have children, they're in sexual immorality, 
all these things are kind of running rampant during this time and all these problems and uh, but the, the Roman Catholic Church was ex still extremely popular amongst the people it, it was very popular and as a result the money still flowed okay um, there wasn't a huge group of people who were saying we need to reform the church most people were happy with the Roman Catholic Church as it was um, more masses for the dead were paid for more churches were built more statues of saints were erected and more pilgrimages were made than ever before so it's and that's leading up to the time of Martin Luther and uh, even Martin Luther himself uh, didn't uh, really want to see the Roman Ch Catholic Church go away he just wanted to reform it okay as you'll hear later about that he didn't want to start a whole new church he just wanted to, to reform it okay so that's a little bit about the Roman Catholic Church let's talk a little bit about the uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, the Holy Roman Empire is a realm in the medieval and early modern times that consisted primarily of Germany, that's it, fill in, and part of Italy, governed by the German ruler. The empire lasted from 962 to 1806. Uh, again, here's the Holy Roman Empire, as we saw two weeks ago, okay? And so you have areas of, uh, of Spain and France and Germany and Italy, that's sort of thing, part of Czech, the Czech Republic nowadays. So that's the Holy Roman Empire that we're talking about. Okay, and those are the, the areas that it was part of, part of Poland. Um, elect, and there were electors, as we learned a couple weeks ago, uh, who elected the emperor. And, um, and then the emperor customarily crowned the pope. So um, electors representing certain states and dioceses chose the emperor. But the position tended uh, to become hereditary as the electors usually selected the ruler's natural heir. He customarily was crowned emperor by, by the Pope in Rome. And I gave you the electors and the, uh, who the electors were and who the Holy, uh, Holy Roman uh, emperors were. Okay? So at this point, it's, it's not just enough um, for us. Okay, I've already mentioned this, that this is, there's some history here. What do we do with that? Okay? That sort of thing. And I think it's important for us to kind of deal with that. Um, it's not just enough to learn about the Catholic Church or the differences with Protestantism. Okay? It should kind of spur us on in our changes in our own lives. So I've got some questions for you. I'd like you to, to talk about really at your table. And then when I come back, I'll, I'll bring us back together. There they are. So I've got some questions here. You can choose one or choose all three in terms of these questions to discuss kind of at your table, okay? And uh, in about just over 10 minutes, I'll bring us back together and, and finish this off. Ready? Go. Okay, I hope you've had good discussions. We do need to kind of close it off. These are, are great questions to deal with, obviously, and I think they, they also help us to highlight, you know, there's differences here in terms of what the Catholic Church was saying, but how that plays out in our lives. And uh, I know all of these have, have played out. You know, the, the Bible is, is God's source of revealed truth. And look, uh, that's important to me. And I need to know what God is saying to me. Certainly there's other things in life that I, that I, that I need to learn for work or other things that I might read about history or whatever they might be or for school but look God's truth is revealed there I better read it and I better hear it and understand it and do it type of thing so I think that these are um, um, good questions for us to to finish off here I do uh, uh, and that is this there was these uh, outlines there that I gave you that's just a a reference or a resource for you we're not going to go through it type of thing uh, I gave you a topic and then the Orthodox is the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, primarily the churches in in Europe like Greek Orthodox Russian Orthodox Church uh, versus the the those who protest the Protestants and versus the Catholic Church in terms of where they stand on some of these things and you can see oh they're they are they're different okay 
They're very different. So that's just a resource for you. If somebody didn't get it, I can get that to you. It's not a problem, type of thing. All right. Um, I'm sorry, is there a question out there that you have? My wife has a question. You referred to it being the Christian Empire. Oh, yes. Yes, so I mentioned Christian back then, okay? I'm talking about back then. That's how they viewed themselves. Whether they were true believers, I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. I, mean, I wasn't back then. Uh, that's how they wrote about themselves. That's what they thought. That's what they believed. So in the materials when it says Christian, uh, remember, we're talking about a time period a long time ago, and we're talking about what they said, not what we would say today. Okay, so if they didn't repent of their sins, then the Bible's very clear, they're not a believer.